Yeah, perfect. Here are some comments. First is this, in this uh, problem number 12, to show that this proposed ring is a field. Well, the, the instructions were really the only difficult part is to show that multiplicative inverses are appropriate. But some of you took that as that that's the only thing you have to show. Well, there's some more you have to show. In order to show that this thing is a field, you first have to show it's actually a ring. A lot of the work that you have to do to show that it's a ring is check because these are simply real numbers and we know that the following things are true for real numbers like commutativity of both addition and multiplication, like distributive law of multiplication over addition, like associativity, like et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of things you just click off, you technically haven't shown, but there were a few things that you had to show in addition to the multiplicative inverse issue. One is, for instance, you have to show closure under addition and multiplication. In other words, you had to show that the two operations, addition and multiplication, are actually binary operations. The addition part is, I mean, it's one step, but it's something you've got to show. That if you take two things of the given form, you add them together, not just that you get a real number, but that you actually get something of the given form. And the interesting one, which is similar to the one that we did in class, is you have to convince me that if you take two things of that form and you multiply them, you get something of that form. That's why I did that one example for you in class where we had a plus b root 5 or something like that. You have to show that the identity is in there. It's, I mean, it's a no-brainer, but it's something you have to know. The identity, both the additive identity and the multiplicative identity, 0 and 1, are of the correct form. 0 is 0 plus 0 times root 2. 1 is 1 plus 0 times root 2. Therefore, both 0 and 1 are of the correct form. The, the task to show that multiplicative inverses exist and are of the appropriate form, well, at least all of you attempted to do that and most of you got to the end, but a couple of you missed what admittedly doesn't hit you over the head like a sledgehammer, but is something you have to take care of. In the end, if you start with something like this, you're going to try to convince me that Inside the set S, there is something so that when you multiply it times this, you get the multiplicative identity, which is this. Okay, it's 1 plus 0 times the square root of 2. And so what did you find? You found that if you took it, you could write it in the correct form just by doing uh, rationalize the, uh, the denominator, and you eventually got this. And a couple of uh, comments to be made here. And remind me if I get this right. A over A squared minus 2B squared or something like that. Minus, or I'm going to write it this way, plus negative B over A squared minus 2B squared times root 2. How'd I do? Okay. All right. Uh, remark 1. Some of you wrote a minus sign here. Okay, that's technically all right, but remember what you're trying to show. The goal is to show that this thing is of the right form. And what do the things in S look like? The things that are of the right form are a rational number plus some rational number times the square root of 2. By writing it this way, I've at least made it look like something plus something times the square root of 2. OK, so it looks like it could possibly be in the right form. And then what some of you did was sort of quit. I mean, if you put a minus sign here, I wasn't too irritated. But if you're going to tell me this is a rational number, I sort of believe you, except what? You can't convince me the denominator is not zero for crying out loud. If nothing else, you haven't started with an arbitrary element in the set. You started with an arbitrary non-zero element in the set. So boy, that's useful here, at least to convince me the denominator is not zero. There's another thing that you need to convince me of. You need to convince me that if you take whatever A is, and you square it, that you don't get the same as if you took B and squared it and multiplied by 2, which is sort of non-trivial, but it's certainly something that you've got to you know, deal with. And the way you deal with it is, can the denominator equal 0? Answer, if the denominator was 0, note, 
a squared minus 2b squared is not equal to 0 because if it was, if it equaled 0, then what would we get? We'd get a squared is 2b squared, which would mean that uh, a squared over b squared is 2, which would mean that the square root of 2 is rational. Square root of 2 is not rational. So it's actually important that you're starting with something that has quotient not rational, it turns out. Uh, if you look at s equals you know, a plus b times root 5 looking expressions like we did in class, then this observation would work. But if you looked at something like you know, a plus b times root 4 or something, well, then this could be 0. Of course, if you're looking at a plus b root 4, you're not really getting anything new because that's just 2 and you're getting a rational number anyway. So. So there was more to be done there than some of you did. I, I'll you know, sort of quasi-apologize for maybe leading you in the wrong direction, thinking that, that the only thing you had to do was show that inverses exist. But, but there was certainly more uh, to, the, uh, to the task here than simply showing that multiplicative inverses are in the set. But there was um, some stuff that you had to do up there. All right, let's see. Next comment. Oh, yeah. Uh, in number 37, the one about the units, most all of you did okay there. A couple of you fell into the trap of telling me that the inverse of A, B is A inverse, B inverse. It's B inverse, A inverse. Remember, you got to switch the order when you're doing inverses of products. But the thing that I was a little bit more concerned with is some of you said, all right, if I take a unit, I need to convince you that the inverse of this unit, well, is in the set. Right? Well, all of you convinced me that the inverse of the unit exists because the original element is a unit. But wait a minute. If u is in u, then you have to show its inverse doesn't just exist, but actually lives in the set that you're interested in. So why is u inverse a unit? You have to show me it has an inverse. Does it? Yeah, what is it? U. So what some of you said was, well, and therefore, because U is a unit, U inverse is in the ring. You know, you haven't told me a, a lie, but you haven't told me the whole truth yet either. So what? I don't care that U inverse is in R. I need to show that U inverse is in the set I'm interested in. And the reason is u inverse is in u because its inverse exists. And why does it exist? Because it equals u. And how do you show that? You take the thing you're interested in, you multiply it by the thing that's proposed to be the inverse. Do you get one? Yeah, you do. So it's I mean, in some sense, it's no big deal, but telling me that the inverse exists isn't enough to convince me that you've you know, shown that this thing is a group, or at least satisfies the third property for being a group. Okay, next. This next one is style point. Oh, question. Sorry, Lonnie. You're saying because do, because one is in you. Uh-uh. Oh, I'm sorry, yes, because one, because one is the identity element of you. Yeah, the implication, and, and, and so the implication is that u inverse is a unit. And the reason it is is because I found something else, it happens to be that, so that when I combine those two, and technically for completeness I should have written it out this way too. But. And if you're thinking, well, wait a minute, that's the equation that you have to write down to convince me that u is a unit. You're right. But it also turns out to be the same equation that you write down to show me u inverse is a unit. All right, so let's see. Next, in section 19, number 23, style comments. I won't write out what some of you did, but essentially it looked like this. Take an item potent A, so A squared is A, so A squared minus A is 0, so A times A minus 1 is 0, so A equals 0 or 1, period. And then at some other point in that problem, you wrote, R is an integral domain. Maybe you wrote it before you listed out those equations or after you listed out those equations. 
if you wrote down, because R is an integral domain, or we know R is an integral domain, and then you gave me that information, and then you moved on, you haven't told me what it is about R being an integral domain that allows you to conclude that A is 0 or 1. So if you're going to write all this stuff out, a squared is A, that's the given information. So A squared minus A is zero, that's just arithmetic in a ring. So A times A minus one is zero, that's just the distributive law. So A is zero or, well you know what I'd really like to see at this stage folks, or A minus one is zero because R is an integral domain. It's this implication, going from here to here, where you use the fact that the assumed ring is an integral domain, and the ring is assumed to be an integral domain. Because here you've got the product of two things equaling zero, and the only way that can happen in an integral domain is if a is zero, or the other one, a minus one is zero, which implies arithmetic that either a is zero or a is one, and you're done. But if you wait to down here to put this statement in, or if you put the statement because R is an integral domain up here, you've just sort of thrown the hypothesis in somewhere where it just doesn't play a role. You have to tell me getting from here to here is where you've used the fact that R is an integral domain. All right. Uh, is that all? Uh, nope. Oh. Um, a, a quick remark for the three of you that didn't change the instructions to R being an integral domain. The original instruction is something about let R be a division ring or something like that. Okay. A couple of you forgot to do that and the, uh, two of the three of you that forgot to do that had a proof that looked like take this and then multiply both sides by the inverse of A. That's technically what you want to do, assuming A is not zero. But what some of you used for the notation for the inverse of A was that. And folks, in general, that's not good notation for the inverse of an element. The inverse of an element in a general ring will always denote by A with a little minus one on top of it. Even though in most of the situations that you knew about coming into this course, that was the same as one over A, A inverse is just better notation, if nothing else. I mean, we've seen a lot of fields where the elements don't look like that, like Z7. It makes no sense to talk about one-third inside Z7, but we can talk about three inverse because we interpret that as the multiplicative inverse of three in that ring. All right, final comment on the homework coming back. Uh, the, the one that I talked about in class a week ago, show that in ZP you have this freshman's dream, A to the P plus B to the P is A plus B to the P. Uh, some of you said, well, okay, here's what you do. You take A plus B to the P and you use, because Z sub P is commutative, you crank it out using the binomial theorem and the uh, Pascal's triangle, whatever it is, and you get this, and then you all said, well, not you all. Some of you said, well, because I can factor P out of each of those things in the middle, here it is, then all these things look like zero in Z sub P, and so all you get is the insides and the outsides. Folks, there should have been some red lights flashing if you did that because nowhere along the way did you use the fact that P is prime. It turns out the only place, the only time that you can conclude that the integer n divides all of the binomial coefficients in the nth row of Pascal's triangle except for the ones on the two ends is when P is a prime. So that's where things should have, you know, sort of uh, had bells go off or whistles go off or something like that. But that's one reason why I wanted to give you that alternate method of getting there, which was used for Maslow theorem, which we know holds for P prime. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. Questions? Hmm? All right. Here is what we're up to tonight. Uh, what we looked at starting last Wednesday is sort of an in-depth analysis of polynomial rings and in particular what we're going to do is focus on polynomial rings where the coefficients are always assumed to come from a field. So that's going to be the standing hypothesis between now and the rest of the or uh, the end of the semester that the coefficients that we're looking at the uh, the, the polynomials coming from our field. Now, in general, it's not going to matter what field it is. It might be the reals, it might be the complexes, uh, 
It might be Z2, it might be Z7. Okay, we know a lot of fields now that aren't simply the complex numbers or the real numbers. Heck, the field might be this field S equals, you know, the things that look like A plus B root 2 or A and B are rational. So there's lots of choices for what the coefficients can look like. What we saw last Wednesday was a couple of things that we get by assuming that the coefficients come from a field. First of all, because any field's an integral domain, uh, we can at least conclude that f bracket x is always an integral domain, because we showed that if the coefficients are an integral domain, then okay. So at least f bracket x is an integral domain, but it's also the case that even though we're starting with f as a field, f bracket x is never a field. There are always things in there that don't have multiplicative inverses. The good example to keep in mind is just the thing called x. There's nothing you can multiply times x. I'll rephrase that. There's no polynomial. There's nothing in f bracket x that you can multiply times x to get 1 because the degrees of products become sums of degrees. On the other hand, though, f bracket x, because f is a field, behaves a lot like the integers. And I tried to play that analogy up on Wednesday We'll continue the analogy, maybe by the end of today, but definitely on Wednesday, with some more sort of uh, similarities between these two structures. So integral domain, so z. Uh, not a field, so z, not a field. Uh, has a division algorithm. Algorithm. And that's what you just wrote out for me on quiz four here. There is some notion of what it means to take two polynomials, divide one into the other in such a way that you write the first one as some multiple of the second one plus some remainder where the thing that you've left over is somehow smaller than the thing that you've divided by. When you do that in the integer, smallness is simply me uh, measured by the size of the integer. When you do that for a field, smallness is measured by the degree of the polynomial that you're leaving as a remainder. And what we're going to see is the existence of that sort of division algorithm inside f bracket x is going to be key later on. Okay. Now, we get to an idea that I mentioned briefly three lectures ago. It's an idea that came up in the homework that you'll turn in on Wednesday. Uh, it is well, it's an idea that we saw at least in the context of groups corresponding to what it means to talk about a function between two groups that preserves the structure. That's what we call the homomorphism. The same sort of thing can be investigated in the context of rings. And we talked about, well, you can, if you want, just call them homomorphisms. But for emphasis, sometimes we call them ring homomorphisms. The general definition was simply a function from a ring to another ring that preserves both the addition equals phi of r plus phi of r prime and preserves the multiplication. Phi of r times r prime is phi of r times phi of r prime for all r and r prime. So that's what ring homomorphism means. At this level, folks, when you talk about uh, a, a ring homomorphism, if you have a ring homomorphism that preserves the additive structure here, all this is saying is that the given function is a group homomorphism. Because remember, the plus operation in a ring gives you a group. It happens to be an abelian group. This second piece, though, is simply a, a, a statement that whatever your function is preserves the multiplication or respects the multiplication. Because you'll remember, in general, the multiplication in a ring doesn't form a group. Heck, even in the nicest situation where you have a field, the multiplication still doesn't form a group. Maybe the non-zero elements form a group in a multiplication. So this second line really isn't the statement that phi is a group homomorphism with respect to the multiplication, because the underlying, but that's fine. You can still talk about, is it the case that phi of a product is a product of the two phi's? And the answer turns out to be that's what's required. Right? And we gave one example of a ring homomorphism, a quick one, the function that takes z to z sub n and simply takes the, the, the mod n or the remainder on division by n. The most important example of ring homomorphisms, though, for us, yeah, for us, um, are what we call evaluation ring homomorphisms. So here is a sort of crucial example of ring homomorphisms. 
isomorphisms. And the example is this. What I'm going to ask you to do is start with um, a field E. Let E be a field. And let F be another field, B a field that contains E, which contains E. Now what I mean by the word contains, I'll make more formal later on, but the intuition is, for example, the complex numbers are a field, the real numbers are a field, and should I call it your intuition or what you've been led to believe up until this course is that the real sit inside the complex numbers? Well, that's nine. Yeah, I mean that's sort of true. It's not exactly true though. Why? Because I mean the complex numbers are at least the way you come to the table in this course is the complex numbers are the things that look like a plus b times root i where A and B are reals, right? That's what the complex numbers are. So are the real numbers inside there? Well, sort of. If you give me a real number, what you're doing technically is associating it with the complex number A plus zero times root I. So there's a little bit of a rub in actually viewing the reals as sitting inside the complexes. But for now, that's what we're going to have you do. Okay? So think of that example. Or maybe think of the rational numbers as sitting inside the real numbers. Okay, that's good. But again, there's still a little bit of a rub because the rational numbers really look like equivalence classes of quotients of integers. And real numbers look like decimals. Or something. Okay, but I mean, if somebody says the reals are inside the complexes, you're nodding your head and saying, move on. You know, tell me what's next. That's what we've got here. And here's the situation. We're going to take some element in a called the bigger field. So I'm thinking of this thing that I'm going to call a subfield, subfield, sitting inside, and I should put quotes on this, sort of sitting inside a bigger field, reals inside the complexes, rationals inside the reals, etc. I'm going to ask you to play the following game. Pick any element you want in the bigger field. Let's call it alpha. If you want to keep a good example in mind, I'll offer two. Either one is good here. You have the real sitting inside the complexes. Pick something in the complexes. I don't care what you pick. The interesting situation will be pick something in the complexes that aren't in the reals. You don't have to in what we're about to do, but that's like pick I. That's not in the reals. Think of that as alpha. Or another good example is think of E as the rationals. Think of F as the reals. Pick something in the reals that's not in the rationals, like the square root of 2, something like that. Okay. Then here's the definition. We define a function, phi, with an alpha in the lower right-hand corner. It's a function that inputs polynomials having coefficients in the smaller field, and what it spits out aren't polynomials, but actually elements of the larger field. So it's a little bit weird to get your uh, sort of arms around the first time you see this. What I'm going to ask you to do is take whatever polynomial you want, but make sure you've built those polynomials with coefficients coming from the subfield, from the smaller field. So if you're thinking of E as the reals and F as the complexes, give me any real valued polynomial. And what I'm going to ask you to do is take that polynomial, and in effect, everywhere you see an x in that polynomial, plug in alpha. Phi sub alpha of something in here, let's call it a0 plus a1x plus dit 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 plus a n x to the n, equals, just plug in alpha everywhere you see an x, a0 plus a1 alpha plus dit 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 plus a n alpha to the n. It's the plug-in alpha everywhere you see an x function. Now the point is this, folks. At least in the setup that I've described here, this thing makes sense. Why? Because the things a0, a1 through an 
are taken from E because I've asked you to plug in polynomials with coefficients coming from E. When I do something like this, al A1 times alpha, this is something in the field E times something that's come from the field F. But the point is that that product, that multiplication makes sense. Because if you've given me something in E, presumably it's also an element of F. So that this product is happening inside the field F. The idea might be, if this is a real number and that's complex I, it makes sense to talk about a real number times I. You get a complex number, it makes sense to talk about 2i, it's the complex number 2i. Even though that thing didn't come from the complex numbers, it came from the reals. This thing did, you can multiply them, you get something in the complexes. So this is guaranteed to spit out something in F, and the punchline is, I'm not going to prove it for you, it's just gutting it out, proposition, proposition these things, phi sub alpha is a ring homomorphism. Proof is nothing more than, well, I'll just say it in words. If I hand you two polynomials and you add the two polynomials together, in other words, you just add the appropriate coefficients, right? And then you drop some number in for x, is that the same as having taken the two polynomials individually, dropped that number in for x, and then added them together? Sure, you get the same answer. Whether you want to call the sum of the polynomials first and then drop in the element, or whether you want to drop in the element and add them, add them together, no big deal. It's the same thing with multiplication. If I take two polynomials and multiply them, just, you know, all right, it's a nastier process. It's bigger. You foil the whole thing out. And then drop something in for x. It's the same thing as having dropped that thing in for x before you multiply, and then you just multiply everything and you drag the x along. So the proof is just multiply it out. Proof, just tedious, I'll call it. Just crank it out. You do a specific example of one of these ring homomorphisms. This is called the evaluation at alpha homomorphism. At alpha homomorphism. And let's do an example. For example, phi sub i from r bracket x to the complex numbers. So the point is I start with one field that sits inside another. We understand how the reals sit inside the complexes. There's this little subtlety that if somebody hands you a real number like 2, that technically they're viewing it as a complex number by writing it as 2 plus 0i. Not a problem. Uh, if I do, for example, phi sub i of, I don't know, 3 plus 4x minus 9x squared, the definition is you take this thing and you just plug it in everywhere you see an x. Is 3 plus 4i minus 9i squared. That's an element of the complex numbers. Now this thing happens to quote unquote simplify a little bit because this is 3 plus 4i, let's see, minus 9 times i squared happens to be minus 1. So this happens to simplify as 12 plus 4i. But that's what you get if you take this polynomial and you plug it into this homomorphism, this particular homomorphism. Now, there's nothing special about I. I could have picked any element in the complex numbers I wanted. For each element in the big field, you get a different homomorphism. You get the phi sub I homomorphism, the phi sub 2I homomorphism, the phi sub 6I plus 7 homomorphism. It, technically, folks, you also get the phi sub, I don't know, phi sub 2 homomorphism, the homomorphism that asks you to drop a 2 in everywhere you see an X. But intuitively, that's not going to be very interesting. If you hand me something that's already in here, the intuition is what's going to get spit out is nothing bigger than the field that you're starting with. That's the intuition. So those just aren't going to be that interesting. Again, it's not that you can't talk about one of these evaluation homomorphisms if you start with something in the smaller field, it's just that they just won't produce much fruit. They would just, you know, won't be interesting later on, you'll see. Okay. These are homomorphisms. Now, what we're, what we're going to do tonight is look at some results that you're familiar with because you're used to working with polynomials with coefficients either in the reals or in the complexes. And what we're going to show you is that 
a lot of the things that you already know in those settings actually hold true for polynomials regardless of what the field is that you're using for the coefficients. So again, most of you, most of you, all of you are familiar with familiar um, polynomials, polynomials, uh, R bracket X, maybe C bracket X, maybe Q bracket X. What we're going to be interested in doing is we show that many, but not all, but not all uh, polynomial rings, rings of the form f bracket x share many, but not all, but not all uh, properties that you're used to. Properties which you have learned over the years about these two special ones, about R bracket X and C bracket X. Let me give you some examples. Rx. For instance, you proved you've used this thing called the, I forget what it's called, the zero theorem or something. And I'll give it a name. Here's what you learned about polynomials in R bracket X, and you've taught this to your Algebra 2 students. That if you hand me a polynomial with real coefficients, and if you find somehow some number, it's called alpha, and if you plug alpha in and zero comes out, then necessarily X minus alpha is a factor of that polynomial. There's some name for that, but I don't know what it's called. So that's something that you somehow know is true for C bracket X or R bracket X. Turns out that's going to be true for any F bracket X. That's going to be a nice one. Contrast, oh, similarly, yeah, similarly, uh, what you prove about polynomials in R of X is that if you have me a polynomial of degree N, it can have at most N zero. You might not have any zeros in R, but even if you allow complex zeros, if you have me a polynomial of degree 2, there can only be two zeros, something like that. Okay? That's another result that you come to the table knowing about polynomials in R and C. It turns out that'll be true for general fields. Quick sidebar, we showed that that wasn't necessarily true if the coefficients that you start with don't come from a field, because you showed for the homework assignment that I just passed back that you can have polynomials of degree 2 where the coefficients come from Z6, not a few, and that those polynomials can have four different zeros. Right? So there's something that's not true for general systems, but it'll be true regardless of fields. Let me tell you something that's not true in general. And this is a hint. I want to know problems to do If I hand you a polynomial in the Set in the setting of R bracket X, co the coefficients are the reals. And I tell you the derivative of the polynomial is zero. Then you can tell me what the polynomial is. Constant. Constants have derivative zero, and constants are the only, actually the only functions from the reals to reals that have derivative zero. Turns out, folks, there are situations, even if you start with a field, F bracket X, where F is a field, like Z2, where there are things that have derivative equal to zero that aren't just constants. Let me give you a good example. If I ask you to start with the field Z2, and I hand you the polynomial X squared, and I ask you to take its derivative, its derivative is 2X. But the coefficients are coming from Z2. So inside Z2, 2 is 0. So the derivative of x squared is 0 if you're working in Z2x. So there's something that isn't shared by all fields. And the reason that's a hint on the homework problem due Wednesday is in past semesters I've seen students submit solutions to that problem 
where they don't use all the given hypotheses. So make sure, especially on that particular problem, of course, on all problems, but on that one in particular, that you somehow use all of the given hypotheses on that question. That's a big hint. Okay. Here's what we show. First, what does he call it? Oh, yeah, the factor theorem. So here's the first one, factor theorem. This first one is one that extends stuff that you already know about this and this to all polynomials, f bracket x, regardless of what field f is. Factor theorem says this, let, uh, let little f of x in capital F of x have uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. degree f of x at least 1. All I'm trying to do is make sure that you're not plugging in the zero polynomial. I think I know. Then the punchline is this. Then, uh, uh, I'm sorry, let alpha also in f. So what I'm doing here, folks, is something slightly different than what we did in describing these evaluation homomorphisms. In the evaluation homomorphism setting, I took a field and then I had some sort of subfield or extension field, either a smaller field or a larger field. Here what I'm asking you to do is take a polynomial where the coefficients come from some field and then take some element in that same field. Then here's the punchline. Then, hmm, if you evaluate f of x at 0, I'm sorry, at alpha, and you get 0. Let me remind you in words what that means. If it's the case that you take this polynomial and you plug that thing in and 0 comes out, if you want to write this as f of alpha, that's how you'd usually write it in algebra 2 class. If phi alpha of f of x is 0, this happens if and only if x minus alpha is a factor of little f of x in the polynomial ring capital F of x. Let me rephrase this. In other words, if you plug in alpha everywhere you see an x in the polynomial little f and 0 came out, that happens if and only if you can write the polynomial f as x minus alpha times some other polynomial where g of x is some polynomial in f bracket x. So this is something that you've been teaching your students since forever in algebra 2. In effect it says if somehow you've started with a polynomial and you've by hook or crook or somehow realize that by plugging some real number into that polynomial everywhere you see an x at zero came out, then necessarily if you take x minus alpha and you long divide it into f of x, that there'll be zero remainder. Okay. I see a lot of you nodding your heads. Well, it turns out, folks, that's nothing special having to do with the real numbers, the complex numbers. That's true regardless of what field you work over. Here's the proof. This is really the most important place where we're going to use the division algorithm for polynomials that you just wrote down for me. Proof is this. So I'm going to assume first that it's the case that f of x is a polynomial that has the property that when you drop alpha in you get zero and I'm going to show that x minus alpha is a factor. It turns out the other direction is almost trivial. Let's see. So let's do that. So assume, that'll be this direction, assume that phi sub alpha of f of x is 0. What do we want to do? We want to show that x minus alpha is a factor. In other words, we want to show that f of x can be written as x minus alpha times g of x. Well, here's the point. Um, since alpha is assumed to be in f, that's given information, you've started with something that lives inside the field that you're using as the coefficients for your polynomials, the point is that this is a perfectly good polynomial in f bracket x. This is a polynomial. I'll tell you what its degree is, 1. I'll tell you what its leading coefficient is, 1. 
This is a polynomial. This is an f bracket x. Why? I have to make sure that all of the coefficients come from this field. Well, that coefficient certainly does. It's the identity element. Every field contains an identity element. And minus alpha does also. Why? Because the hypothesis is that alpha is an f. So minus alpha is also an f. Additive inverses are in there. And so this thing is also an f. So both of the coefficients of this polynomial happen to be an f. So what does that mean? It means I've got a polynomial in f bracket x. So I've got another polynomial in f bracket x. And because this one is degree at least 1, it makes sense to divide this one into the other one, as in the division algorithm. So now use the division algorithm for polynomials. Algorithm, which you've just written out for me, theorem 23.1. Divide this one into f of x. And we get this, that f of x can be written as q of x times this thing. This is what I'm using in the role of g of x plus some remainder. And I'll tell you something about the remainder. Where what? Where either the degree of r of x is less than the degree of the thing that you've divided by, there it is, or r of x is the zero polynomial. It's the division algorithm. So you're all nodding your head. That's good, because you remember that. All I've done is use the division algorithm where I happen to have chosen that thing to be the thing that I'm dividing by. Okay. Question so far? OK, but look, folks, I know what the degree of x minus alpha is. It's 1. The highest power of x that appears is 1. So that was easy. So what I've asked, no, what I've guaranteed is that this thing I've written down as the remainder has degree less than 1. I only lose one possibility. It means they have degree 0. Or that the polynomial is 0 to begin with. So because of this inequality, we actually have either the degree of r of x is 0, or r of x is 0 itself. And remember, from last time we had to make this distinction. This statement, folks, simply means that the polynomial r of x is a constant, but not 0. And this statement means that the polynomial r of x is a constant, but is 0. We had to distinguish these two out because we didn't want to assign a degree to the 0 polynomial because it mucked up some of the formulas. But I can rephrase this this way, i.e., r of x is some element in the field. Because degree 0 means it's a constant, and r of x equaling 0 means, well, it's in the field because 0 is in the field. Phrased another way, whatever this remainder is doesn't have any x's on it. It's just some element from the field. I say, wait, you've written it as r of x. Well, yeah. Beforehand, when I've stated the division algorithm, when I hauled out the division algorithm, I don't really know what that thing is. It's some polynomial in f bracket x. But given the constraints of this particular use of the division algorithm, in the end, what we've actually shown is that r of x doesn't contain any x's. So we can write, write r of x as, let's call it c, where c is some constant. Looks like we're doing calculus, huh? Where c is something which contains no x's. Something in f which contains no x terms. You're still nodding your heads. Maybe you're slightly, I don't know, disbelieving at this stage. All right. I'm going to say this one more way. The thing that I've tacked on the end here, this thing called R of X, has no X's in it. In other words, i.e., if I do phi sub alpha of R of X, If I ask you to plug alpha in, everywhere you see an x in R of x, that's what this means. Well, there are no x's in R of x. So you just get R of x. Hmm? You want to view it this way? Maybe it's easier. R of x is just some element of the field. If you plug alpha in everywhere you see an x, 
You don't see an axis, so you just get the element of the field back. So whichever point of view you'd prefer to take, doesn't matter. They both say the same thing. Ah, that's nice. And here's why. What are we trying to do? We're trying to eventually show that if I take f of x, that I can write it as x minus alpha times something. So the goal is to really show that r of x is 0. At this stage, all I know is that something it's something in the field, but here's how we show that it's actually 0. So we show that, in fact, r of x is 0. And here's how. We have f of x is a q of x times x minus alpha plus r of x. Yeah. That's what we concluded from the division algorithm. Now here's what I want you to do. Now apply the evaluation homomorphism to both sides. In other words, drop alpha in everywhere you see an x. Right. So I do phi sub alpha of the left hand side is then necessarily phi sub alpha of the right hand side. Q of x times x minus alpha plus r of x. Folks, if two things are equal, then the same things get spit out if you run them through the same function. That's all we've said here. But wait a minute, let's see. This is phi sub alpha of, R of f of x. That's no big deal. But phi sub alpha is a homomorphism. OK, admit I didn't prove that for you. But that was given. So phi sub alpha of one thing plus another is phi sub alpha of that plus phi sub alpha of that. And phi sub alpha of one thing times another is phi sub alpha of that. Plus. So I'm going to use the fact that phi is a homomorphism. Phi sub alpha is a ring homomorphism meaning that it respects both the addition and the multiplication. That gives me this. Phi sub alpha of q of x times phi sub alpha of x minus alpha plus phi sub alpha of r of x. So I've used both that phi sub alpha respects the addition and that it respects the multiplication. I'd holler if you're uncomfortable here. That's nice to know it's a ring homomorphism. All right, let's do one more step. No, let's do two steps. No, let's do three steps, all in one line. Watch this. What's the hypothesis? The hypothesis is that phi sub alpha of f of x is 0. So we're assuming the thing on the left is 0. So here's the hypothesis. Hypothesis, that's given. How about this thing? Well. Phi sub alpha of q of x, who the heck knows what that is? I don't. What does phi sub alpha mean? It means drop alpha in everywhere you see an x. OK. Done. I dropped an alpha in everywhere I saw an x. I see one x. Put an alpha in. Plus, ooh, the phi sub alpha of r of x it is r of x. E sub alpha of r of x, oops, sorry, is r of x. Previous observation. So boy, those are convenient. So I've dropped alpha in, use the hypothesis that when you drop it into f, you get 0. I've simply dropped it in because that's what this instruction tells me to do. And then a previous observation says if you happen to drop alpha into this thing, it doesn't change it because that thing r of x, even though it's written like a polynomial, we've established actually doesn't have any x's in it. Now we're almost done. Yeah, Lonnie, question? Just the part where you drop the alpha into the f of x, how do you get zero? Just that, that's what we're assuming. That's the starting point. Yeah. All right. One more step that's almost interesting. Alpha minus alpha, better known as zero. Zero times anything is better known as zero. So this thing turns out to all boil down to zero. And so I get zero equals r of x. That's exactly what we wanted to show. So the punchline is, in fact, we have f of x is q of x 
times x minus alpha plus zero. In other words, just rewriting, and technically I'm doing two things at once, but we can do that. Plus zero means I don't have to worry about it. And multiplication inside f bracket x is commutative. So I can switch things around, and I then have written f of x as x minus alpha times something, where this is in f bracket x. We're done. It's nice. So this fact that you've been imparting to your Algebra 2 students, that if you have what's called a zero for the polynomial, if you have a number that when you plug it in spits out zero from the polynomial, then necessarily if you try to factor out an x minus alpha, necessarily x minus alpha is in fact a factor of the original polynomial. Questions? Comments? Technically, we're not done because I stated this theorem as an if and only if statement. We've shown if this, then this. That's the hard part. Let's do it the other way. Suppose x minus alpha is a factor of f of x, which means in equation form, just this. What do we want to show? We want to show that if we drop alpha in, that zero comes out. Well, folks, if you drop alpha in everywhere you see an x into that polynomial, means you've dropped in an alpha there and you've dropped in an alpha there. But as soon as you've dropped in an alpha here, you get alpha minus alpha, which is zero. So you get zero times who cares what, and you get zero out. Okay. So knowing that x minus alpha is a factor immediately gives that when you plug alpha in, zero comes out, because then you've got a factor that looks like alpha minus alpha. In other words, you've got a factor that looks like zero. So the converse is easy. Just go ahead and plug it in. So just for completeness, I'll say the other way is just plug in alpha in alpha. Okay. All right, so there's the factor theorem. What you knew about polynomials before, at least polynomials over R bracket x, in fact, hold true regardless of what the coefficients look like. All right. Questions? No, yeah, no, all right. Um, let me give you... A s yeah, let me give you a second corollary to the division algorithm. You can think of this one, the factor theorem, as the most important consequence of the division algorithm for f bracket x. And we certainly used it. We wrote down this, this equation. Um, I won't spend the time. It would take about 15 minutes or so to prove it. But here's a second consequence. So another consequence of the division algorithm of the division algorithm algorithm is proposition if we're working in a field uh, if the uh, f of x is in capital F bracket x and again the underlying understood hypothesis is that capital F always stands for field and the degree the degree of f of x is n, give me something, let's see, do I need it? Yeah, bigger than or equal to 1. I guess it technically is true for degree 0 polynomials, but those are uninteresting. So give me a polynomial that has some guts, that has some x's in it. Then the punchline is, then there are at most n zeros of F in capital F. In other words, there are at most n elements. I'll write them out this way. Alpha 1, alpha 2, up through alpha sub t, where t is necessarily less than or equal to n, that have the property so that when you plug this particular polynomial into one of these evaluation homomorphisms that you get zero. And I'll list as the proof simply use the division algorithm division algorithm the factor theorem thing that we just proved, and what it boils down to, and the fact that 
uh, f bracket x is an integral domain. Okay, so I won't go through the whole proof of why it's true that in f bracket x where f is a field there can be at most n zeros for a polynomial of degree n. I will though contrast this result to the result that you already know which is true for polynomials with coefficients in the reals but at least the only proof that I was exposed to growing up before I got to an algebra course was the calculus proof. And the calculus proof is, let's see, what are you trying to do? You're trying to convince me that if you hand me a polynomial of degree n, that from a graphical point of view, it can only cross the axis at most n times. That's what this result says, that there's at most n zeros for it. There's at most n different things that you can plug in that spit out a y value of zero. And the proof of that is sort of by by induction, you show that when you take the derivative of this thing, that the polynomial can only change direction n minus one times. And if you've got a function that can only, you know, change direction n minus one times, then you've guaranteed that it can only cross the axis at most n times. But here, you know, we got no concept of what the graph of a function might look like, or changing directions, or up and down, or but this result turns out to be true regardless of what the underlying fields look like. So regardless of whether you can do any sort of analysis or geometry or draw pictures of it, it's the case that you can only pull out at most n zeros. Uh, for those of you that saw the number theory course with me last spring, we actually gave a relatively rigorous proof of this result in the particular case where the underlying field happens to be z sub p where p is prime. But for those of you that didn't, it's, I mean, it's just no big deal. Just suffice it to say that we could get there if we chose to. Okay. All right. Do I want to do this now? Yeah. Let me in the last. Yeah, let me do this and then in the last five minutes I'll go ahead and do that. Um, so I've been trying to play up this analogy or the similarities between rings of the form f bracket x, where f is a field, so these polynomial rings with coefficients coming from a field, and the ring of integers. They're both integral domains, neither of them is a, neither of them is a field, they both have this notion of a division algorithm or a notion of size of elements, size of elements inside the integers is just how big is the integer size of an element inside the polynomial ring is What's its degree? Well, there's a totally important concept inside the integers, at least inside the positive integers, but I'm going to ask you to sort of extend things out as well. It's the notion of primeness, prime numbers, and that somehow the prime numbers, at least for multiplication, are sort of the building blocks of all of the admittedly positive integers, but for now we're just going to talk about all of the non-zero integers can somehow get as products of primes, right? Maybe you have to slap a negative sign in front of there, no big deal. The question is, if this analogy is really a good one, is there some sort of corresponding notion inside polynomial rings to the notion of being a prime number inside the integers? And the answer is yes. I mean, intuitively, what is a prime number? It's one that you just can't break down any further. Rephrased, it's one that you, you actually can break down. It's just when you do break it down, it's only done in sort of a trivial way. I mean, seven you can break down as seven times one. All right. Well, it turns out we now have the language to talk about prime numbers inside the integers where we include positive or negative. I'm not going to talk about zero in this context, but if you hand me a non-zero integer, and I don't care again if you're starting with positive or negative, here's what I'm going to intuitively think of as a prime integer. It's one where you might be able to factor it as the product of two other integers, but if you do, at least one of the other integers that you factor it into is a unit in the integers. So 7 is prime because the reason is there's actually a lot of different ways to write 7. It's 1 times 7, 
It's also negative 1 times negative 7. So there's two ways of writing 7 as a product of two integers. But notice in both of those situations, if I write it as 1 times 7, 1 is a unit in the integers. Obviously, it's the multiplicative identity. But I can also write it as negative 7 times negative 1. But negative 1 is a unit inside the integers. So there's a sort of extended version of what it means to be a prime number. It completely agrees with what you understand to be a prime number. It's something you can't factor further down. It's just we can talk about that idea in a slightly more general context to include the negatives. Well, if we look at things in that slightly more general point of view, an integer is prime if it's the case that, oh, I don't want to include 1 as a prime. It's easy to do. An integer is prime if it's, first of all, not 0. So forget 0. 0 is just a mess. If it's not 0, if it's not a unit, so that throws out 1 and minus 1. And if it has the property that any time you can write it as a product of two things, that necessarily one or the other of the things is a unit. Okay. So definition of prime integer. So again, I'm playing up this sort of connection between z and f bracket, f bracket x. Uh, an integer p is prime in case, first of all, p is not 0. Secondly, p is not 1 or minus 1. I'm going to rephrase that as i.e. p is not a unit in z. And third, uh, if you can write p as a times b, where a and b are in z, then either A is a unit or B is a unit. So that's the definition of a prime integer. And admittedly, I've extended the definition now of prime to include some negatives, but, but I mean, it's not going to cause you to grieve. This says that negative 2 is prime, negative 3 is prime, negative 5 is prime. I mean, the negatives of all the things you know to be prime are primes, and nothing else is. So that's what a prime integer means. So the question is, what's the corresponding idea in f bracket x? And the answer is this. We simply call them, well, things that you can't break down any further, we call them irreducible. So a polynomial, little f of x in capital F of x, is called irreducible in case, well, in case it does exactly the same things that the prime numbers do inside the integers. In case it's not 0, not a unit, and the only factorizations are, are uninteresting, are units. Okay. All right, now the first question is this. If you're sitting inside f bracket x, what are the units? What are the polynomials that have multiplicative inverses? Well, that's pretty easy. If you hand me a polynomial that's actually got some guts to it, if it's got some x's or x squareds or something like that, it's impossible to find another polynomial to multiply times this one that gives an output of just 1 because you can't reduce degree at all. So the only things that have a chance of being a unit inside f bracket x are the things of degree 0, and those are precisely the units. If you hand me the polynomial 2 in r bracket x, it's a unit. Its inverse is a half. It's no big deal. Just tell me what the multiplicative inverse was anyway. You're thinking, well, 2 is not a polynomial. Well, yeah, it is. It's a polynomial of degree 0. It's 2 plus 0, x plus 0, x squared, blah, blah, blah. Can you find something so that when you multiply 2 times it, that you get 1? Sure. The polynomial 1 half plus 0, x plus 0. It's sort of silly, but it works. But those are the only ones that work. So when we talk about things being a unit inside f bracket x, what we're really looking at are the non-zero constant polynomials. And that's exactly what irreducibility is going to correspond to. In case, first of all, f of x is not equal to 0. Secondly, f of x is not a unit, is not a unit in f bracket x. I'll rephrase what that means, i.e., f of x, oh, the degree of f of x is not 0. 
Those are the elements of the field, or the degree zero things. And third, finally, if you've factored f of x as, let's call it g of x times k of x, where the two polynomials, g of x and k of x, are in the underlying ring of polynomials f bracket x, then either Oh, then either that one is a unit or that one is a unit. Which phrased in the context of f bracket x means then either g of x is in f or k of x is in f. Think irreducible means the only way you can factor this polynomial is sort of by cheating. Cheating means, you know, if I hand you the polynomial, let's say x minus 3, can you factor it? I think, well, what do you mean factor it? Well, yeah, I can factor it. Watch. x minus 3 is 2x minus 6 times 1 third. I mean, 2x minus 3 times a half, sorry. 6 minus 3. This is cheating. I mean, you can't just multiply by constant. And what we do is say, all right, you can always factor any polynomial if you allow me those sort of silly factorizations. Irreducible means, though, that those are the only factorizations that, that can happen. So these are sort of like saying, yeah, you know, if you give me the number 7, I can certainly factor it. It's 1 times 7, or it's negative 1 times negative 7. But none of the factorizations have any guts. Okay. The intuition is that the polynomials that somehow don't break down anymore play the role of the prime numbers inside the integers. What we're eventually going to do is take every polynomial and write them as products of irreducible polynomials. And a huge question for us, in fact, it's a question that literally will take the rest of the sem semester, and we'll never get a complete answer to it, but we'll at least get some good partial answers to it, is if you hand me a field F, and you hand me a polynomial in that field, is the polynomial irreducible or not? And it's somewhat similar to the question inside Z, which turns out to be a hard question. You know, here's a number, is it prime or not? Well, you can sort of do some, you know, just beat on the thing, but it, it's hard to tell. Or can you build another prime number? You know, this question of where's the next prime number? It's a hard question. So there's going to be some you know, s similar degree of difficulty in answering questions about irreducibility, but I think this would be a good place to, to make one comment and quit. It turns out that the notion of irreducible, and, and I, I probably should have put it here. Let me go ahead and, and go back and put it in and then show you why it's important. It's called irreducible in f bracket x. I mean, I asked you to take a polynomial in f bracket x, but it's important to talk about irreducibility in the context of a specific field. And here's why. Example, it turns out, we'll show next time. Look at this polynomial. Um, f of x is the polynomial x squared plus 1 in q bracket x. So here's a polynomial. Question, can you factor this polynomial in q bracket x? In other words, can you write this thing as something other than, yeah, I can write it as 2x squared plus 2 times a half, but forget that. Can you write it as some sort of factorization where each piece has some guts to it? Turns out the answer will be no. So we'll show next time, it turns out that f of x is irreducible in q bracket x. But this time, I'll show you, but take the same polynomial. If I give you f of x, same polynomial, but I now ask you to view it as a polynomial inside the polynomials where you're allowed to use complex coefficients, then it's not irreducible. Then f of x is not irreducible in c bracket x. In other words, there's actually a way to take this thing and factor it down where each of the factors has some guts to it. I'll show you how to do it. x squared plus 1 is x minus i times x plus i. Hmm. And of course, the idea here is that by allowing me to use 
somehow a larger collection of things as the coefficients of the polynomials, that then allows me to write down this thing as a polynomial in the system and allows me to write down this thing as a polynomial in the system. And of course, if you multiply this out, you'll get exactly that. This isn't, of course, a factorization in Q bracket X because these coefficients don't this. So the notion of whether or not a polynomial is irreducible depends highly on what the underlying field might be. And that turns out, well, that means that we're going to have to be somewhat careful in talking about irreducibility in general. But it turns out this question of, well, if you're working over a field and you've got a polynomial that's irreducible, is it possible to somehow make the field bigger and find a field where the polynomial isn't irreducible anymore, where the polynomial eventually breaks down? Question, Lonnie. What is it about number three on the at x column here that you say either of those have to be, what if they were both from field? Uh, I mean, what's special about either? Um, exclusive case. Um, yeah, not necessarily exclusive. I mean, so this, this could be. Both, well, but if both were from the field, then f of x would be in the field. Because then it would be a product of two things in the field, and so then f of x would have been degree zero to begin with. And that would, that would put you here, but we've explicitly excluded things from the field. As okay. okay. Um, it's Monday, so here's a homework assignment. But folks, next Wednesday, we have no class because school is closed on Wednesday for Thanksgiving holiday. So this will be due on a short turnaround. So due next Monday, but it'll be a shorter assignment. Just one section here. Um, so that is the 19th. And the homework is this. In section 23, problems 1 through 4, 9 through 16, 27 through 30, and 34. And then I want you to turn in these five. 2, 12, 16, 17, and 28. And that'll be it. Uh, I know we have a homework assignment due Wednesday, and some of you are still working on that. You know enough to start at least the first two problems on this assignment, and by the first, I don't know, 20 minutes of Wednesday's lecture, you'll be able to at least attack the remaining three problems.